I imagine that there are many people uh, here that would be able to say, you know, Pastor, uh, either there's been a time in my life where I was dealing with depression or I'm actually dealing with some of that right now. Okay, I see some people fanning themselves, Doyle. We might need to kick the, uh, the air up just a little bit there. So, but, um, and, and so, you know, this is a relevant topic, and we want to make sure, you know, that we talk about things that are relevant uh, in, our, in our culture uh, as well. The, the church is the place where people ought to be able to come to find the answers. Amen? I believe that. And so, and so I'm going to start off with a reading today that I came across, and, and I, I, I love this reading, and it's something that I believe uh, you'll be able to see the meaning for it here in just a few moments, but it, it's entitled, Are You Most or Some? Are You Most or Some? It says, Most read books. Some write them. Most attend conferences, but some create them. Most fake intimacy, some live intimately. Most love great design, some design. Most listen to great music, some write great music. Most point out problems, some solve them. Most admire beautiful art, some create it. Most receive generously, some give generously. Most imagine what should have been. Some imagine what can be. Most criticize, but some create. Are you a most or a some? Isn't that good? Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. And God, we thank you just for the powerful choir special we heard just a few moments ago. God, you are such an awesome God, and it's so good for us to be reminded that you use broken vessels. Lord, none of us are perfect. The only one who truly was perfect was your son. And God, we just thank you that you're willing to use us and improve us and help us to become more like you. Holy Spirit of God, move in this place right now, touching hearts and changing lives. And we'll be so careful to give all the credit to Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. I wanted to read this to start out because in just a few moments as we get into the scripture about Elijah, we might be tempted to criticize Elijah for what we read about his life. It would be great to have Bible heroes who never failed, but that's not a reality. And the truth is, Elijah took risk. He was a doer and not just a talker. But now Elijah is totally burnt out. And, and really, we see that Elijah is showing all of the signs of someone who is battling depression. Now, last week we looked at anxiety, and we said that anxiety tends to have more to do with the future and really worrying about the future. We talked about that sense of dread, you know, about the future and what, what could happen. But, but when we talk about depression, depression has more to do about the past. It has to do with regrets. It has to, to do with feelings of doubt and negativity, often brought on by massive changes that take place in our life. And I just want to say this as well. You know, I shared this last week with regards to anxiety, and really the same thing is true with depression, but I want to say it anyway, that there are very real physical reasons why people suffer with depression. And for that reason, uh, we should be willing to go and see a doctor. We should be willing to go and see a counselor. Uh, if medication is prescribed, we ought to be open to it. You know, as we said last week, uh, there's nothing wrong or unspiritual about having to take medication. Amen? I guarantee you, uh, most people in here are probably on medication for something, right? 
why, why is there a stigma attached to medication that has to do with your mind, right? Your mind is still a part of your body, right? Um, and so, you know, we should, we should be open to that. And, and as we said last week, it doesn't make you more spiritual if you decide not to take uh, medication. And so I just wanted to say that uh, out front. But, you know, getting back to the story, it sounds really spiritual to say, that I'm ready to go be with the Lord. And we're going to read that here in just a few moments. And that's really what Elijah was saying. You know, Eli- Elijah wa- was saying to the Lord, Lord, I've, you know, I've, I, I've, I've, I've done quite a bit, you know, what you wanted me to do. I maybe didn't finish everything. But, but God, you know, I, I feel like I'm no better than my fathers. And, and I'm ready to come home and be with you. And, th- and that sounds really spiritual to say that. But the problem was God wasn't finished with Elijah yet god still had more for elijah to do and we'll we'll talk about that uh here in in just a little bit but let me ask you this when we think about this idea of of you know really serving as a christian and really being burnt out as a christian have you ever thought any of these things before god i've i've taken the risk god i've i've put myself out there god i've worked really hard God, I've taken the high road. God, I'm trying to do what's right. And, and God, if you would like to come back today and take me home, that would be fine with me. I'm ready to go. I can tell you as a pastor, I've talked with a number of people over the years who have said that very thing to me. Pastor, I've got to tell you, you know, I, I'm ready to go be with Jesus. If, if, he would, if he would come and take me right now, you know, that would be just fine with me. And and I always want to say, no, don't say that. You know, don't say that. We, do, we don't want you to go. We want you to be here. And by the way, as long as you're still here and, and there's air uh, breathing uh, through your lungs and there's a heart beating uh, in your chest, man, God still has something for you to do. Even if you can't get up and get around, man, you can still pray. And pray. prayer is powerful, amen. Man, we need prayer warriors in the church. But I imagine that many of us have felt that way, and today we're going to look at Elijah's journey into the valley and understand why it is so important to know, listen, not only where God is, but also where God is not. And so the first thought that we're going to consider today is this thought, and that is God's compassion in our depression. God's compassion in our depression. And let's begin reading in verse number one. The Bible says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all of the prophets with the sword. Now, you remember the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal, and you remember how Elijah was able to call fire down from heaven. You remember that story? And and when the people saw it, they said that, uh, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God, and 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 Elijah uh, was able to have the the prophets of Baal uh, that were there executed. And so that's what Ahab is talking about here. It says, then Jezebel, that wicked queen Jezebel, sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, "So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow." about this time look at verse 3 and when he saw that he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba which belongs to Judah and left his servant there now I want you to think about it for just a moment here's Elijah I mean you stop and think about all of the miracles that Elijah was able to see God do you think about how Uh, Elijah pronounced that there'd be no rain and how God stopped the rain and then uh, how God brought it back again. Elijah was able to see that. Stop and think about uh, how God worked in the life uh, of Elijah again by when he called down fire from heaven. And if you remember that story, uh, man, Elijah told him that with that sacrifice, he said, I want you to pour water all over that sacrifice in the trench around it. And man, the, the Bible says that when the fire fell, from heaven not only did it destroy the sacrifice but it licked up all the water and it burnt the rocks i mean can you imagine uh the power 
and, and the heat that, that was there for that to happen. And so Elijah has seen God do these incredible miracles, but now the Bible says he's running for his life because this wicked queen sends a message and says, hey, just like you executed those prophets of Baal, basically she said within 24 hours you will be dead as well. Your life will be taken as well. He himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die. And he said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. I want you to think about God's compassion for his children and how you see that compassion displayed in the Bible. And, and, and really where, where you see it on full display is, it, is when it comes to the destiny of his children, the destiny of his children. And, and the reality that God wants to see his children fulfill the destiny that he has for them. I think about Lot. Lot was considered righteous, the Bible says. That simply means that Lot had righteousness imputed to him because of his faith. But we all know, you know, Lot was not, you know, Lot didn't have the greatest testimony uh, in the world. But God considered him to be righteous. And by the way, let me just say this. Uh, this helps you to understand, you know, how powerful it is, the relationship that you have with God, because God said that he could not destroy Sodom until Lot and his family were removed. Stop and think about that. That's a pretty powerful statement, that God said, I'm actually holding up my judgment until you were taken out of Sodom. Okay? So... Your life and your testimony and your ministry is powerful in the eyes of Almighty God. Abraham, God used Abraham even though there were times where the Bible says Abraham was deceptive. God used Jacob even though he deceived his father and his brother. God used Moses even though Moses killed a man. God used Samson even though he lived recklessly. God used David even though David lied, cheated, and ultimately murdered someone. God used Solomon even though he drifted from God in his latter years. God pursued Jonah to fulfill his destiny. God used Peter even though he denied Christ three times. God used Paul even though he persecuted Christians. And God rescued John Mark and got him on the right path again. I'm simply saying, hey, listen, man, when, when you look at some of those stories, you realize that there are times where, where God was probably more concerned about their destiny than they were concerned about their own destiny. That's something to think about. God has a will for our lives, and he will do whatever it takes to keep us on the right path to fulfill our destiny. But God deals compassionately with us because we belong to him and we're his children. Amen? We have a compassionate God. God is compassionate when his people fall into a state of depression. And, and I want you to think about some of the symptoms, you know, when you think about depression and ask yourself the question, have I ever been depressed before? Or am I dealing with depression right now? One of the, the symptoms is maybe you can't sleep or maybe you, you sleep too much. You can't concentrate and find that previous, uh, previously easy task are now difficult. You feel hopeless and helpless. You can't control your negative thoughts no matter how much you try. You've lost your appetite or maybe you can't stop eating. You're more irritable and short-tempered than usual. You have thoughts that life is not worth living. 
And it's interesting that when you read the story here about Elijah, that Elijah checks most, if not all, of these boxes. And, and listen, I'm not a professional psychiatrist, but if, if I had to guess at it, I would say that Elijah was clinically depressed. I believe that. But I love the compassion of the Lord here. God sent his angel to minister to Elijah in his time of need. Look at what God did here. This is powerful. First of all, just sending the angel was an act of compassion because it told Elijah, Elijah, you're not alone. I know exactly where you are, and I'm still in control. And by the way, let me just say this as well. There might be some folks in here that would say, well, Pastor, you know, I hear what you're saying, this thing about depression, but I'll be honest with you, Pastor, right now, I'm not really depressed. Now, maybe there have been some times where I have been, but, but I'm not really depressed right now. Well, that's great because if you're not the one who's dealing with depression, then maybe you're the one that gets to be the angel, right? Maybe God wants you to be like this angel and, and, and that you would look for those who are dealing with depression and you would seek to be a blessing and to minister to them at this time. Not only that, but the angel provided food for Elijah twice. The angel was compassionate in how he treated Elijah. And it's interesting that the Lord does not scold Elijah, but deals with him truthfully. And we're going to talk about that in just a few moments. He says to him, hey, listen, Elijah, you think you're the only one, but you're not the only one. By the way, let me just say this. When it comes to this thing of depression, the devil will always try to think that you're all by yourself. The devil will always try to do everything that he can to get you to isolate yourself because if he can get you to isolate you uh, yourself, then he knows he can get you to become even more depressed than you already are. And listen to me. I want you to think about this. Sometimes the depression that we're dealing with is actually based on a lie. It's based on a lie. What you're basing the depression on isn't really true. And in fact, if we could see all that God has for us, if, if God would allow us to see what heaven would be like, if God would allow us to see our loved ones that have gone on before us, our place in God's kingdom, I promise you, we would not be depressed. I promise you, but the devil doesn't want us to see those things. But God is a God of compassion. I was reading the story of Mother Teresa. I thought this was really interesting. Mother Teresa was born over 60 years ago in Yugoslavia, and, and she responded to God's call on her life while still a teenager. She said that a missionary strong challenge uh, to her gave her life meaning and it resulted in her appointment to the city of Calcutta. And, and some months later, she said that she saw a sight that completely revolutionized her life and would ultimately bring her worldwide fame as Good Housekeeping Magazine's most admired woman. What was the sight? Listen to this. This is what she saw. She saw a homeless woman dying, lying in the gutter, being eaten by rats. And, and when she saw that, it says compassion compelled her to beg for an abandoned Hindu temple from the government and convert it into a crude makeshift hospital for those who were dying. A comment of hers became her life's mission she said if there is a god in heaven and a christ that we love nobody should die alone well that's that's a that's a that's a great motto isn't it i don't care what denomination you are what a great motto but see that's the kind of god that we serve and that's the kind of god that we love and and, and can i just say this I'm so glad that Halesford Baptist Church is a church of compassion. I really feel like that this church is the hands and feet of Christ. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard about the needs of church members 
only to hear that someone had already anonymously stepped up in order to meet that need. They didn't want any fanfare. Simply pleasing God was enough of a reward for them. It could have been a hospital visit. It could have been a meal prepared. It could have been providing financial help to allow a child or a teen to go to camp. Maybe it was a shoulder to cry on, a prayer that was offered, or money that was given to help with gas or food. But somebody in this church, God touched your heart and you showed compassion. I want you to think about the compassion of our Lord. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 36 says, For the Lord will judge his people and have compassion on his servants when he sees that their power is gone and there is no one remaining, bond or free. Psalm 86 and verse 15 says, But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. Psalm 145 and verse 8 says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. Matthew 14 and verse 14 says, And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. And Luke 15, verses 18 through 24, this is the story of the prodigal son. And it says, And I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. Look at this. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's all of us here today. But the father said to his servant, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. That's the kind of God that we have. A God of great compassion. And listen, here's what I'm saying. If we see it in the Bible and we know that Elijah experienced it, you might be here today and say, Pastor Paulson, I'm dealing with depression in my life right now. Or I can remember times where I have, and I'm sure that there will be times again in the future. And I'm simply saying that God loves you and that God has compassion on you. And man, during those times when you're dealing with depression, you need to lift your eyes and look around because I promise you, God will bring ministers around you to minister to you. But you need to open your eyes and look for what God is doing. You've got to look for it. God is there and he loves you. And he will minister to you because he is a God filled with compassion. Not only that, but we see God's position in our depression. Not just his compassion, but his position. Look at verses 8 and following. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights. By the way, that must have been some cake that, <laughs> that the Lord uh, gave him there. Look at this. As far as Horeb, the mountain of God, and there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, now look at this. By the way, this, this is a great question for all of us here this morning. You know, when, when you're running from whatever it is that you know that God wants you to do, when you are, when you are running, when you are dealing with depression and you feel like you can't go on anymore, and the Lord says to Elijah, he says, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? I don't think that was, uh, you know, a question of condemnation. I, I really believe that God is trying to get Elijah to examine his own heart. Wh why are you here? What are you doing here? So he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord. God of hosts for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. Behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and 
broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. Look at this. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him and said, same question, right? What are you doing here, Elijah? Look at, look at his response. Okay, Same question from God, same response from Elijah. And he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord. God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. That's how I know that Elijah is burnt out, that he is battling depression, because he gave the exact same response to the Lord. And, and here's what we need to understand. Sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that God is a victim of circumstances the same way that we are, okay? So God caused this wind to pass by Elijah that was so powerful that it tore rocks apart. I mean, can you imagine the power that must have been exerted for something like that to happen? And then God caused this earthquake to take place. And then God caused a fire. But the Bible says about all of those that God was not what? In them. You see, God wasn't in them. He was outside of them. God was not affected by them. And see, that's the problem. A lot of times, you know, we like to kind of pull God in and say, God, I just want you to know how I feel. I want you to feel what I feel. And we want God to feel our circumstances, but I'm here to tell you, you know, God is compassionate and God has sympathy for us, but God is not bound by circumstances. God exists outside of the circumstances. Amen? And we need to understand that. This is what we need to be reminded of. You see, we talked about this before, how God was totally self-sufficient. You know, we, we think about all of the things that God has created, the universe and everything in it. But, but when you go back to eternity past, there was a time where there was no universe. Uh, there was uh, no heaven. There was no earth. There were no animals. There was nothing except for God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so God is completely self-sustaining. God is totally self-sufficient. God doesn't need anything. And so God is not going to be caught up in the same things that you and I get caught up in. Have you ever heard someone say, you know, if you were in my situation, you would have done the same thing I did? You ever heard that before? And, 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 and you thought to yourself, but I'm not in your situation because I didn't make the same decisions that you made, okay? And so Elijah is in this cave, and many incredible things are happening. But God was not in those things. He was not inside of those things. He was not held captive by those things. And it's interesting that throughout Elijah's ministry, God used the elements in a special way. Um, we talked about God's announcement uh, to Elijah as far as holding back the rain. We remember how God provided for Elijah at the brook Cherith. We remember how God rained down fire from heaven, and we remember how God allowed it to rain again. So fire and water were a big part of Elijah's ministry. By the way, it's interesting, and we won't go there today for sake of time, but it's interesting if you go to the book of Revelation and you read about the two witnesses that are there uh, at the tribulation time. Uh, one of those witnesses is pretty much confirmed to be Elijah. And he's going to have a similar uh, ministry of, at, at, at that time. 
but Elijah is thought to be one of those witnesses. Now, another is thought to maybe, uh, you know, be Moses. Some have said possibly Enoch because the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. And when you look into the Bible and you look at those, uh, I mean, Moses died, but when you look at Enoch, uh, Enoch never died. Enoch was taken right up to heaven while he was still alive. So there's some different thoughts about who those two tribulation witnesses are, but the scholars are pretty sure that at least one of them is Elijah. So it's exciting to realize that, that God does end up taking Elijah. God gives him a job to do. And by the way, I think that's a great thing that God gave him a job to do because that told Elijah, hey, if God's given me a job to do, then guess what? Jezebel can't touch me, right? Because if God gives you the job to do, you better believe that God is going to empower you and he's going to see you through to do whatever it is that he has called you to do. God is not the subject of our circumstances, and much of what God does is behind the scenes. Because a little later we said God reveals to Elijah that he is not the only one standing for what is right. That there are 7,000 in Israel who are loyal to Almighty God. Elijah thought that he was the only one, but he absolutely was not the only one. But I think that, you know, sometimes we get caught up in just the, the, the mess of life, if I can say that, the busyness of life, you know, the day-to-day things. And sometimes when you're caught up, you know, in, in that day-to-day busyness of life, and things get muddled, sometimes it's hard to hear the still small voice of God. And I think part of what God was doing here was he was providing a contrast for Elijah. I think he was showing Elijah, Elijah, I I want you to see that I'm in control. If, If I can cause a wind that breaks rocks into pieces, and I can cause an earthquake, and I can cause a fire, I think I could probably take care of Jezebel. You know, I, I mean, I think that was part of it, but I think the other part of it was that, you know, God, you know, gave these incredible demonstrations of his power, but then he came in right after that with the still, small voice. And I think that what God is saying to us today, especially if you're in a situation when you, where you're dealing with depression in your life, I think God is saying, Hey, listen, you need to be listening for the still, small voice. Because I promise you, the voices of this world and the voices of the enemy, they will be negative voices, and they will be loud. And they will try to you know, tell you all kinds of terrible things about yourself and the circumstances that you're living in. But the way that you'll know it's the Lord is that it'll be that still, small voice And I promise you that it will be a voice that will not be against you, but it will be a voice that will be for you. I promise you that. It might be weakness on our parts, but sometimes we just need God to reveal some things to us so that we can keep on going. We just need God to put a few pieces of the puzzle together so that we can have some kind of an idea of what he's doing. But in the end... We all need to be reminded, listen, that God is enough. Amen? Hey, listen, there's some people in this room, you've been through it before. You found that out personally. You've been down to the place where either you had nothing or you came to the place where you realized that nothing else matters except for God. And when you finally get to that place where you you realize that, then that helps your heart in the midst of depression. And so I, I, I just want to I want to close with this today. This is a quote from Beth Moore, but I thought it was a powerful quote. If you guys could put that up. She said, The pit is an early grave that the devil has dug for you, hoping to bury you alive. I want you to think about that pit is an early grave that the devil has dug for you, hoping to bury you alive. 
don't give him the satisfaction. 